Hello, Graham, you list. Hey, Graham. Hey. <laughs> I got a joke for you. Uh, you sure, you're sure it's for me? That didn't exactly sound like my name, but... Uh, can you prove that it's not? Uh, no. You have your birth certificate here? I do not. Hey, Graham, what did the cowboy say <laughs> when his beloved border collie got lost while on the cattle drive? What did, what did the cowboy say when his beloved border collie got lost on the cattle drive? Yeah. Um, shucks. <laughs> close dog on <laughs> <laughs> okay um hmm i think you're scraping the bottom of the uh cowboy barrel the pickle barrel uh i give him that, dare you i'm giving that a four <laughs> you know that's exactly what i was thinking so i'm happy with that i'll accept it what can you uh what can you do this well, better david unfortunately um today i saw an old man uh fall down a well <laughs> Talk about a pickle barrel. <laughs> yeah, I guess he couldn't see that well. <laughs> he couldn't see that well. Uh, did you make that up? No. No, this is a classic. This is a sterling yeah. joke. Yeah. This is in the Hall of Fame of dad jokes. Yeah, yeah. It's, um... I It's, um... It's, a, it's leaving you speechless. 3.9. <laughs> 3.9? 4.1? Okay, either one. All right. Well, you know what? Enough of the nonsense. Let's get on with the nonsense. Welcome back to Withy Windle, a whimsical interactive show for kids who love stories, words, and groan-worthy jokes featuring your favorite authors and illustrators. It's part book club, part game show, and it's your weekly adventure through the wild world of wordplay. I'm David Kern. And I'm Graham Pittman. And we are here to talk about stuff and suches. Such on and so forth, um, as long as it's bookish. That's right. I think. Bookish suches and so forth. Bookish suches. Including, for example, Graham, mm -hmm. our very special guest this week. Her name is Vesper Stamper. She has a new book out. She's an illustrator and an author. And we uh, had a great time chatting with her. And yeah. can't wait to share that conversation with you. Besides doing excellent, beautiful work, her name is also very fun to say. Vesper Stamper. Vesper Stamper. That's right. It's a great name. We also have, of course, and I'll work backwards, Riddle Time. We're going to give you the answer to last week's riddle and then bring you a new one. We also have Story Time. It's Graham's turn to bring one of his favorite stories. We also have Snack Time and maybe a little bit of Halloween chatter. Yep. Considering and today is Halloween. And uh, we also have other suches and so forth. That lazy might, words. That might appear. Lazy words. Yeah, that's what I said. Other suches and so forth. Oh, I, was being, I was being lazy, lazy. Graham. Yes, I was being right. lazy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Walked right into that one. <laughs> Well, before we get started, Graham, mm -hmm. should we tell the kids about who is presenting this week's episode? Yes, let's do it. You know him as Samuel. Graham, fill it in. Oh, Dennison uh, Smitherton. Smitherton. That's right. He is the creator of the Million Plus Selling Green Ember series, and he has a new story with an old soul, the can't miss first adventure in a thrilling new series. It's called Jack Zulu and the Waylander's Key, and it's an enchanting adventure in the tradition of Tolkien and Lewis as well as Spielberg and Lucas. But this fantastical journey launches in rural West Virginia in the 1980s with a half Appalachian, half African kid trying to escape the town he sees defining his small, sad life. Jack discovers a gate hiding a city between 12 realms and finds out where he truly belongs in this surprising and satisfying adventure. S.D. Smith, he wrote this book with his son Josiah, which, as we've said before, we think is pretty cool. Uh, my kids love it. And so if you are... A kid or a family that loves the Green Ember series, but is getting, uh, you know, getting ready for the next thing, mm -hmm. looking for a new adventure, absolutely check out Jack Zulu and the Waylander's Key. You can go to jackzulu.com to sign up for the newsletter or to pre-order it. It officially releases on November 15th. And as you know, if you've been listening to this podcast, we are hosting a launch party for Jack Zulu and the Waylander's Key on November 20th here in Concord, North Carolina. And we are... Uh, what adjective would you use for how excited we are about non this? Nonplus. No, wait, no, That's wait, no, wait. Really excited. We are, but how excited? Stupendously. We are stupendously, I guess, superbly. An adverb, yeah. Superbly. Well, I like adverbs. Spelunkingly. Oh, splunkingly. I don't. Runningly. Oh, wait, that's it. Uh, we are very incredibly excited. excited. Yeah, very excited. To and be, you know what? I have said. never read Jack Zulu and the Waylander's Key because it is not out yet. Well, you However, um, you do have a copy of this I book. Do. I do. And uh, I did run into your son today. Ah. And he said, hey, have you read Jack Zulu yet? And I said, no, 
I don't have it. And he just looked at me and kind of shook his head because he has been reading and it. And then he walked away. Yeah, he did. Some people aren't special, he seemed to be saying. That's how I know it's good because he was excited to talk to me about it, but he couldn't because I did not get the advanced copy. <laughs> I think it was just a uh, it was just a coincidence. I would think it just came to the bookstore or something. So we are very excited and, and grateful to uh, S.T. Smith for helping make this episode possible and for creating great stories like uh, Jack Zulu and the Waylander's Key. All right, Graham, time for snack time. We have a very special snack this week. First of all, it's a very special time of year mm. because it's the time of year when our favorite ice cream. Is on the shelves. Is it your favorite ice cream too? It's pretty close, other than like, you know, frozen vanilla. custard from a, <laughs> from a restaurant. I know you like vanilla. I, I will I like other stuff too. This is it's peppermint ice cream season. We're yes. eating bluebell peppermint ice cream. And it's a it's a favorite. It's one of our favorites. It's my favorite ice cream. Mm. And I don't peppermint is not like not my favorite thing. Um I like a candy cane, but I'm not like Jones and I'm not like going crazy for peppermints. But I don't know. You mix it with mm. some cold cream. Yeah. Uh, it's just like the Those best little thing bits ever. Of crunch in there. And I don't know. Like, okay. This is my wish. One of my wishes this year, you know, for Santa <laughs> or the Tooth Fairy or whoever. Um, <laughs> the Easter Bunny. Uh, would be to have peppermint ice cream as a non-seasonal flavor. Mm. But would I like it as much if I could get it all the time? That's the thing. It's the one ice cream that I think is best when it's cold outside. Yeah, I think that's true. You need to have that chill in the air to really get the... I think, or maybe you need extremes. Like maybe if it was 110 and you got well, it... Well, if it's 110, like... any ice cream is delicious. <laughs> you could give me like... Not like pistachio. hot... Pistachio. No. Uh, people like pistachio ice cream. Not hot don't. pepper, hot, hot Frank's red hot ice cream. <laughs> that wouldn't be great if true, it's 110. True, true. Or like horseradish. So, so we're eating this ice cream, but that's not even the special thing that I was talking about. Because one of our listeners sent in i think they i think he might have been concerned about the amount of sugar that we eat during snack time sent us some proteins he sent us some protein something savory he sent us meat <laughs> not just any meat meat he made well made i don't know about made uh meat uh, he cured cured i don't know Man, meat uh, judah judah um you're gonna need to write us in and correct our language yeah, exactly. here we know that this is deer uh, that's been it's venison, stick. venison, venison meat stick. Venison meat stick. Is it jerky? Mm. It's not jerky. It's not, it's not. It's more like you know. It's meat stick. Judah, we need help. We don't know no. what jerky is. We don't know what sticks. Well, we, we got to certify this. Is this a? Yeah. Is it certified? We need to send this in to find out if certified it's sticks. a real meat stick. Is there a certified meat sticks company? Yeah, this could be a meat or is log. It a sub. I don't know. It a could meat be a twig? Meat, meat cylinder. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's delicious. So there's two flavors here. There's jalapeno cheddar, which I think mm -hmm. is my favorite. I'm eating it right now. Yeah. I, I go for the original. Mm. <laughs> and the original. Which is a little sweeter. Wait, is it, or is it barbecue? It's like a honey barbecue. There, oh, it's, Something yeah. like, uh, yeah. So it's got a little sweeter. Mm. So Judah works oh, so good. works on their mm. their farm doing processing of, of some of the meats and I know he his his mom told us that I think he, he tans the hides right salts them salts them cures he, them whatever it's very cold and he Lonely. listens <laughs> listens to the podcast out there in the cold so Judah thank you very much uh, this is a delight yeah we thank got, you so much for thinking of us and looking out for us we got meat cylinders potentially sticks if they get certified <laughs> we've got peppermint ice cream i've got some hot tea out here this is it's, it's a great. good night that's great and i have some water also and you know what else david what we, we haven't mentioned this yet what today is halloween that's right that's right it's october 31st already october 31st now is last time or maybe you didn't mention this i can't remember you've told me your one of your kids was going to dress up as Tolkien. Yeah, did, I don't know if that I don't know if that came to fruition. Is he going to change his mind? Um, well, it's hard to it's hard to dress up that way and for people to know what you are. You just look like a professor, right? Yeah, you could be any professor. That's you could true. be the nutty professor. That's <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, who, that would have been appropriate. <laughs> he could have dressed up with a professor, but then cross it with Mister Peanut. You know, the yeah. guy with the monocle. Oh, and the top hat. Well, that would be a. Um, a very distinct costume. Right. The it would peanut be. peanut professor. Yeah. The, the nutty, Mr. No, Planters. The nut, yeah, Mr. Planters. Mr. Yeah. Professor Planter. Mr. Yeah, professor Planter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know that character probably has a real name. We just don't know it. Um, Leon. We've got, a, in our household, we've got a couple princesses. 
Uh, and then my son's going. You and Rowan. <laughs> <laughs> and then my son's going as a Link from Zelda. So okay. I was making him a shield today out of yep. some wood, okay. G- doing a jigsaw, cutting out some stuff. We got to paint yep. it this weekend. Yep, yep. But man, it's coming up fast. You guys are uh, really all out on on this. Okay, so not not really all out. But we live on a street that goes all out. That's true. And every time we pull out of our driveway, we're in Halloween town. So I think yeah, for a long time. I think we it are like. like July. <laughs> I think we are more Halloweeny than ever, um, just because of our proximity to Halloween town of our town. That's right. And everybody um, from our area comes to your street. Yeah, yeah. People go from one end to the other collecting candy yeah it's yeah it's very they they deck out and 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 then our kids come back to our house and we have like one pumpkin uh, <laughs> and they're always Uncarved. like there was like a, we they want to do a whole halloween you know huge uh decorations and spread but you know like on halloween night we're not even home so right. i don't even see i don't know i don't see the point so if we, we were going to stay home and hand out candy maybe then we'd decorate more but our house is just dark on Halloween. Should we do anything to mark the occasion here on the podcast? Oh, yeah. I was thinking about okay, that. Okay, what should we do? What should we do? Well, last week, what did we we talked a little bit about our favorite Halloween. underrated candies. Yeah, yeah. The Tootsie Roll, the fruit Tootsie mm-hmm. Rolls, and the circus peanuts. You know what would be underrated for Halloween? 100 grand. Judith Meat Sticks. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to just be handing those out. You could sell them on Halloween. That's true. Trick or treat or Business show me the idea money. idea there for you, Judah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I think we should maybe let's come up with some Halloween costumes that we should wear, or maybe I'll come up with one you should wear. Okay. And then I'll come up with one you should wear. Okay. Well, now I got to think about it. So I've got one for you. Okay. Okay. Do you remember the most annoying show on television when you were a child? (laughs) Ooh, uh, I watched a lot of TV as a kid and most of the shows were shows were annoying. What was the most annoying one? I can tell you. Was it annoying for like the parents? It's annoying for everybody. For everyone? And it's got a reputation for being annoying and awful. Ren and Stimpy? Barney. Oh. <laughs> so here's my costume idea for you. Yeah, okay, okay. Barney, but not but you know like normally when you're Barney, you have to have like the the whole dragon outfit on, right? Yes. The dinosaur or whatever he is. Dinosaur, he's not a dragon. He's not that cool. So <laughs> he's a dinosaur and yes. you normally would have to wear the whole dinosaur outfit. But the great thing about that is you could be dressed as, as, uh, as this dinosaur, but nobody would know who's under there. So you have to go as Barney, but you have to have a cutout for the face so that when everybody sees you, they know it. They, they know exactly who you are. This is sadistic. Oh, I just think it's funny. <laughs> wow. So Barney, but without the anonymity right. of the suit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can't beat this. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was... Mine was just you, like a big... Uh, In a cowboy outfit? <laughs> no. Half cowboy, half pirate, right? Yeah, so Jack Sparrow. <laughs> so, you're, hmm. so you've been on a pirate cowboy kick, right? Yeah, right, just since I was so a So a pirate yeah. boy or a cowrit. <laughs> so maybe you've got the cowboy hat and the spurs. Oh, yeah. But yeah. the rest of you is pirate. Hmm. Or maybe just like you, you create a big um, uh, styrofoam bowl and fill it with hot milk and you go as a graham cracker. <laughs> How does he just sound like a graham cracker? Do you get a bunch of cardboard? I don't know. This is for you to figure out. I'm not making it for you. I'm suggesting it. <laughs> now, you also had another idea. I don't know if we should do it, but you had another idea. Okay, well, well, go ahead. You had an idea of, uh, not a costume, but for the Halloween episode to come up with a eight word Scary story. story. Uh, okay. Let's let's do this. Should we just do it together? Should I, we build eight well, words I together? Did three. You, you came up with your okay. Yeah. C- tell us what you've got. Okay. And that's when he remembered the unlatched window. How's that? And that's when okay. What well, well, give me some more? The amulet that isn't an amulet couldn't be removed. That one's nine words. I just couldn't. I couldn't like. <laughs> well, okay, that doesn't count then. Uh, and the other one was, and that's why you never. And it looks like I didn't actually finish it. Maybe that's the scariest part of all. There's no <laughs> instruction of what you should never be doing. <laughs> bum bum bum. Uh, are you terrified? You're you're terrified. I can tell. Okay. All the listeners are terrified. They, got- they turned it off. They don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. Okay, you ready for mine? Yeah. Okay, I'm kind of cheating because the last word is a number, but are you ready? Well, a number is a word. Christmas comes but once a year, except 2022. What? 
Has it come twice? Thrice? Or zero. Or zero. Okay, so it's either scary or really, really, really hopeful. Too much Christmas could be scary. <laughs> true. Just like too much peppermint ice cream might overload us. That's true. Speaking of which, hold on one second. I'm going to take a quick uh, little, uh, little snack. No, speaking of Halloween, mm -hmm. did you know that we actually have another sponsor oh, for yeah. this week's we episode? Do? How come nobody tells me these things? <sighs> yeah, so speaking of Halloween, um, this episode of Withy Wendell is sponsored by... Tom's off-brand Halloween Town. <laughs> Located exclusively in failing suburban malls, Tom's off-brand Halloween Town <laughs> is just the place to find your last-minute costume. This would be good for you to find maybe that... Uh, uh, the, the cow... The, right? Yeah, exactly. Are they cheap? Yes. Itchy, I'm sure. Will anybody know what character you are? Debatable. Why pay a premium for Spider-Man? When, for $1.99, you could be web boy. <laughs> Cinderella? Sounds expensive. Why not try Ashy Girl? <laughs> why be Luke Skywalker? These are lazy words. <laughs> why, why be Luke Skywalker when Space Boy is a fraction of the price and true. still comes with his exciting catchphrase? <laughs> oh, you don't know it? I'm in space. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was going to be like, Wait. Uncle Owen. What's that you say? You really want to trick or treat as Captain Hook this year? Well, why not just try out Rear Admiral Reginald? <laughs> <laughs> Instead of a hook for a hand, he has crippling anxiety about the sea. <laughs> <laughs> Baby Yoda? No, we don't have him. But we do have Seiji Small Green. <laughs> Harry Potter? Oh, you'll want Wan Boy and his scar that looks like a full ride to a prestigious private institution. <laughs> uh, looking for an original character? We've got just the thing. Yeah. Consider these mild, but halfway interesting options. Floppy Felix. <laughs> Wheat Aroma Alice. Crispy Kenneth. <laughs> All right, sorry. Mm. Crispy Kenneth. <laughs> and who could ever forget about Wet Jim? The, sc <laughs> the scariest thing about Wet Jim is that no one knows why he's so wet. <laughs> so come on down. Why be on brand when you can be Tom's off brand? Halloween time. Found at the corner of... <laughs> Yeah, you know, they didn't give us any call to action. Oh, okay. You just got to find it and you just oh, you, oh yeah, well, yeah, suburban mall. I yeah, don't know. exactly. It's just like you just run across it. Well, because the great thing yeah. about most Halloween stores, right? You go to one of those. It used to be a Verizon cell phone store exactly. or something, right? Now, now it's Tom's off brand yeah. Halloween Town, where you could find crispy Kenneth <laughs> costume. Or, what's it? Wet, wet, what? Wet Jim. Wet. <laughs> How could you forget about Wet Jim? Rear Admiral Reginald. All right. Uh, well, thank Happy you so Halloween. much. Happy Halloween. Thanks so much to them for sponsoring. I really appreciate that. Yeah, they, but also, if you decide to go for Halloween as wet gym, we need a picture. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Uh, they We haven't billed them yet, but I'm assuming that invoice isn't going to get paid. Yeah, they, I feel they, like it they feels, seem like they're cheap feels sketchy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Graham. Let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to have... Um, <laughs> lazy words. All right, we're back with lazy words. Lazy words. Graham, what was yeah. last week's lazy word? All right, so last week, uh, we gave the word rain cloud as our lazy word. That's and right. We, uh, yeah, we thought that was particularly lazy. So we asked for your suggestions on what we should rename the rain cloud to be. Uh, Rhiannon wrote in and she said, rain cloud should be called life giving. Because rain cloud stores rain, and rain is water, and water is life giving. Just follow it that logic. A, it, it is. I, I believe that that logic checks out. Uh, Raymond for the lazy word uh, says sky sponge. <laughs> I like that. It does. It does have the uh, the appearance of being a sponge, sponge like. Hannah says joyful buckets. Abby <laughs> says driver's bane. Uh, <laughs> you don't like driving in the rain, so that's right up your alley. Uh, Eva natural air freshener. Do you, hold on. Do you like driving in the rain? No, no. Okay, all right. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Neil says Regenolkin. Is this your brother, Neil? No, it is not. 
Um, and then Sarah says, dump truck of blessings. <laughs> <laughs> the kids always send in such uh, pleasant things, right? You know, if we just did it, we'd come up with something like cynical or like yeah, yeah. goofy. And or like rain honest. cloud. Yeah, oh, like yeah, rain cloud. Sorry. Yeah, you know, adults came up with rain cloud. <laughs> uh, Olivia would say uh, thunder coming or flower pleaser, hmm. and then Audrey and her family uh, came up with a whole bunch here. Okay, precipitation distributor, the dropper, the droppers cool precipitation station. I, <laughs> I like the dropper. That's a good one. Like, yeah. oh, the dropper's coming. Uh, the soaker, soaky toky. Soaky that's, <laughs> that's good. Weeping puffball, <laughs> uh, sorrowful mist, the drizzler, and drizzle whizzle. Drizzle, I mean, drizzle whistle. All super strong. Yeah, all right. Yeah. And we got a bunch more. I'm sorry. We can we can never read them all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but keep on writing in. Hopefully next time we'll read yours if we did not this time. Uh, so what's this week's, Graham? This week. Oh, my goodness. You, right. you, you feel confident in this one, don't Well, you? this one is, I've been kind of like circling it because I think it is one of the laziest. This is one of the ones that like kind of started. Defi- defines the notion I, of a lazy word? I think so. Yeah, okay. It's real bad. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um. All right, David, you are sick. You're calling in sick from work. You can't go into the bookstore, okay? No, not right now. Not right now. Oh, okay. This is just like, imagine the situation. Imagine Imagine that I call my boss. No, 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 no. (laughs) Nope, nope. Let's go back. You're seven years old. I'm seven years old. You have woke up with a sore throat, which in your case, you're kind of excited about because it was a school day. Yippee! So instead of going to school, your mom takes your temperature. She's like, ooh, 101, time to get out the hot graham cracker. I mean, the... uh, uh, the tea and the chicken noodle soup <laughs> with milk, hot milk in it, um, and graham crackers. And yeah, yeah, uh, okay, okay. I mean, the medicine. It, some of this is. <laughs> it's just slanderous. Some of it. Is some it slanderous? <laughs> yeah, slanderous, uh, exactly. All right. Uh, but you get to stay home. <laughs> okay. You get to stay home. Yeah. All your siblings have to go off to school. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Well, you got to stay home and do what? Rest, right? Right. Rest. So you're, you're, read. you can read for a little while, but then, you know. Yeah, you take some naps. You take some you know? naps yeah, yeah. and do something. Maybe yeah. turn on the television. Okay. Now mm-hmm. on this television, yeah. um, the people uh, in TV land, the producers and actors and directors and cameramen have made yeah. something for you to watch. They have made something that they are going to show to you. So you turn on the TV to watch. A TV show? A show. Oh, they're showing me a show? It's a, it's a show. Mm, yeah. Show. It's yeah. a show. Yeah. I'm going to turn on the TV and I'm going to watch... You're going to watch a show. a show. Yeah. That's pretty... Yeah. It's so bad, it takes you a minute before... Yeah. And then your brain kind of cracks. Yeah, yeah. You're watching what they're showing, and we've just called it show show yeah and then even if you're like this is a tv show it's not better they want to show me something and so they just call it a show like like you know like a a long time ago we would have said it's your uh your your program program program, which isn't good either right but But then it got better than show i don't know show 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 yeah that's pretty they're showing you the show you're gonna watch what they're showing yeah. The show. Yeah. And the thing that they're showing is the show. It's actually an incredible process to get a bunch of actors. That's right. A script. Right. The lighting, the costumes, right. uh, the director, the producer, the finances, the yeah. structure, yeah. the whole camera. Yep. The electricity that brings it. Those uh, craft they, services. They, they bring, and then the TV has to be made. They have snack time <laughs> on TV That's show right. sets. <laughs> and then the whole process that it's transmitted through, uh, what, I don't know, electrons, magic into your house. And they're like, here's your show. They went through all that. And then they just said, oh, show. Guys. So, yeah, we need, we need some help here, Graham. What is this called? It cannot, it can no longer be called a show. It is illegal. We are, we are making it illegal. You will be arrested from this point forward if you keep calling it a show. So I'm super confident that we're going to have amazing responses mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and also that the people who make shows yeah they're gonna hear this are gonna hear it and they're gonna change it and it's gonna solve the world it's gonna be one of those <sighs> problems that's gonna finally be so if the kids want to participate in this process of saving the world how should they do that they should uh write us in at goldberry no <laughs> at podcasts <laughs> at goldberrybooks.com podcasts at goldberrybooks.com that is where you will send us your lazy word uh uh, changes 
That is where suggestions, that is where you will send us at the end of the show your riddle answer. Uh, if you have suggestions for future lazy words, or if you have suggestions for tales or fairy tales or folk tales that you really like that you want us to read on the show, send those in too. Also send in your pictures of wet gym. Don't, I'd never, I'd never want to see a, a visual representation of wet gym. <laughs> Crispy Kenneth, though. Crispy Kenneth. That's fair. That's I'll fair. see a picture of Crispy Kenneth. Crispy Kenneth. All right. Crispy <laughs> Kenneth pictures. They're podcast at goldberrybooks.com. Okay. We're going to take a quick little uh, little break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to do story time with uh, Uncle Graham, at least for Graham's nieces and nephews. And for the rest of you, it's story time with... Wet Jim. <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of you, it's story time with Graham's nieces and nephews' uncle. <laughs> Okay, it is time for a story time with Uncle Graham's nieces and nephews' uncle, Graham, a.k.a. Wet Jim. <laughs> okay, we're back. It's time for story time with Graham's nieces and nephews' uncle, Graham. That is correct. <laughs> a.k.a. Wet Jim. No, not a.k.a. Wet Jim. A.k.a. Crispy Kenneth. I, mm, I don't want the any of these. inventor of Wet Jim. <laughs> I don't want any of these nicknames. Um, no, I didn't. That's this is That was a real ad. Oh. A, a, I didn't write it. E, right. It came through the mail. Uh, it was a.k.a. In the a reader of mail. Crispy envelope. <laughs> All right. This, uh, this tale um, this week is called The Six Sillies. This, <laughs> and this is a Belgian uh, tale. A uh, fairy tale ready yeah it's already funny all right once upon a time once upon a time there was a girl okay who reached the age of 37 okay without so she's no longer a, a girl. girl she's a yeah. woman okay. she's my age i'm 37 uh and she had not been married yet okay and and not because she was 37 but because she was so foolish <laughs> that no one wanted to marry her it's a sad situation i'm glad we dropped that bit of information in there because otherwise i would you know it would have been like i wonder why yeah she's young as far as she's cool yeah. yeah so one day however yeah, yeah. all right here's a turn okay. turn of events early, here. early in the story uh one day however a young man arrived to pay his addresses to her and her mother beaming with joy sent her daughter down to the cellar to draw a jug of drink okay so let me get this straight mm -hmm. a young man yeah comes to her house uh-huh to Give her his addresses to her? Yeah, to say hello and maybe get to know her a little bit. Okay, and then the mother sends her down to the cellar to get something for him to drink. Yes, okay. or for them all to drink or whatever. Got yeah. it. okay, yeah. okay, all right. But as the girl never came back up... <laughs> oh, okay. The mother went down to see what had become of her and found her sitting on the stairs, her head in her hands, while by her side the drink was running all over the floor oh, no. as she had forgotten to close the tap. A slow trickle. What are you doing there? asked the mother. I was thinking, what shall I call my first child after I am married to that young man? All the names in the calendar are taken already. She met the guy that day and was immediately like, "Yes, time to name our children." Yeah, she was very silly. Yeah, silly girl. foolish. Yeah, mm -hmm. she, but this is what she does every time she meets a guy, and that's no wonder <laughs> she's not married. <laughs> okay, so she's sitting on the stairs crying because all the names of the calendar are taken, so she can't. Uh, right, she, 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 she can't name her kids like no, March or April no. or whatever. The mother sat down on the staircase beside her daughter and said. I will think about it with you, my dear. The Support, father, supportive mother. The father, who had stayed upstairs with the young man, was surprised that neither his wife nor his daughter had come back upstairs. And so, in his turn, he went down to look for them. Right, right. Smart. Detecting a pattern. He's feeling awkward. Yeah, right. He doesn't yeah. want to. It's just like he doesn't know the, lagging. He doesn't know this young man. They, they're not sure about the sense of humor. Like, do you tell a cowboy joke? Yeah, and, and the young man didn't come to pay addresses to him. Right. Yeah. To yeah. her, it was all this gone. whole thing. So uh, he he went down to look for them. Okay. Yes. He found them both sitting on the stairs, while beside him the drink was running all over the ground from the tap, which mm. was wide open. Still a slow trickle. What are you doing there? The drink is running all over the cellar. We were thinking, what should we call the children that our daughter will have when she marries that young man? All the names in the calendar are taken already. Well, said the father, I will think about that with you. So they're so supportive of one another. <laughs> As neither mother nor daughter nor father came upstairs again, the man grew impatient and went down into the cellar to see what they could be doing. See, he had two options. He could go out the door immediately or into the cellar. Yeah. He chose the more dramatic one. <laughs> 
He found all three of them sitting on the stairs. Yeah. While beside him, them, the drink was running all over the ground from the tap. It's the slow trickle. What in the world are you all doing that you do not come upstairs and that you let the drink run all over the cellar? Yes, I know, my boy, said the father. But if you marry our daughter, what shall you call your children? All the names in the calendar are taken. Okay, so this girl is foolish, but she, she might come by it honestly. She might come by it honestly. Yeah. Seems yeah. like her parents might. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Nature, nurture, etc. Yeah. yeah, exactly. When the young man heard this answer, he replied, Well, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I am going away. And when I shall have found three people sillier than you three, I will come back and marry your daughter. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why he should have said such a thing, you know, in a tale might not go well for him. We'll see. Yeah. You got to know better than that. If you're the character in a story like this. So he continued his journey. And after walking a long way, he reached an orchard when he saw some people knocking down walnuts and trying to throw them into their cart with a fork. Mm. I imagine that's a pitchfork, which either way, bad idea. A little fork, like a little, little dessert fork. What are you doing there? He asked. Uh, We want to load the cart with our walnuts, but we can't manage to do it. The man advised them to get a basket and put the walnuts into it. Seems like a man who just like sees the world (laughs) in a a very practical way. Or maybe in a, in a, maybe he's just, yes, there you go. (laughs) So he told them, get the basket, put the walnuts in it, dump the basket in the cart. Well, he said to himself, I've already found someone more foolish than those three. So he went on his way, and by and by he came to a wood, and there he saw a man who wanted to give his pig some acorns to eat. And he was trying with all his might to make the pig climb up the oak tree. (laughs) What are you doing, my good man? Yeah, that's the right question. Asked he. I want to make my pig eat some acorns, and I can't get him to go up the tree. If you were to climb up the tree yourself and shake down the acorns, the pig would pick them up oh i never thought of that (laughs) well here's the second fool said the man to himself some way farther along the road he came upon a man little did he know (laughs) some way farther along down the road he came upon a man who was pouring hot milk onto his slanderous onto his graham crackers what are you doing Uh, uh, sorry no that's not what it says It says something even more ridiculous. He came upon a man who had never worn any trousers and who was trying to put on a pair. So he fastened the trousers to a tree and was jumping with all his might in the air so he would hit the two legs of the trousers as he came down. (laughs) It would be uh, much better if you held the trousers in your hands, said the young man, and then put your legs through one by one. I'm glad you admitted that that is crazier (laughs) than hot cream. Dear me to be sure, you are smarter than I am. That never occurred to me, said the very strange, (laughs) pantless man. Um, And having found three people, four, including uh, David and his hot graham crackers, uh, more foolish than his bride or her father or her mother, the man went back to marry the young lady. And in course of time, they had a great many children. But they named them. That is the that is the question, isn't it? What would you have named them? I don't. I mean, June is fine. <laughs> Wait, certainly, you can use the same name twice. Certainly not December. <laughs> April. Ap- apologies to December's out there. Yeah, yeah. If there's any December's listening, oh, that is a silly, silly tale about mm-hmm. six silly, silly people. Yeah, yeah. So much silliness. You know what? Just the right amount of silliness for this podcast, That's though. If you the ask perfect, me, perfect, perfect amount. All right, Grant, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we are going to uh, introduce you to Vesper Staper. We're back and excited to share this week's guest with you. As Graham said, her name is very, very fun to say. Her name is... Vesper Stamper. Vesper Stamper. Vesper? Stamper. Vesper? Stamper. She is a really great author. She has written... uh, (laughs) <laughs> Two novels previously, but she has a new book out. Uh, just came out. It's called Berliners. Just now, just came out. Just came out. Right. Yeah. She also is an illustrator. She's written illustrated a bunch of other people's books and children's books and things like that. Now, parents, uh, we just want to tell you: be aware that 
her books do uh, touch on some tragic historical things. So they're probably not for the younger kids. They're going to be for older kids, you know, your teenagers and things like that. So just be ju- judicious. They are probably closer to YA than, than younger middle grade books. But because she illustrates um, kids' books and because her books are for kids of, even if they're for a little bit older, we were so excited to talk to her. So, ah! oh my goodness, not this again. Hey, keep your hands where I can see them. Glenn McCarty, author of The Golden Road of Tumbleweed Thompson, currently on Kickstarter, is back again. You know what? I'm not mad about it. It just took me by surprise. I know. I know. But it, my goodness. We got, through, we, you know, we got through this whole episode, and I thought, okay, he's not going to surprise us again. I'm not going to have a small heart attack. Yeah. And then here he is. And I didn't have a small heart attack, but I was still surprised. Hey, should we do some more trivia? Eh, all right, let's do it. Glenn, are you ready for the next question? Yes. Okay. I have nowhere to go but down at this point. Yeah, what are you, four for five now? According to eyewitness accounts, what gunslinger could hit a dime nine out of ten times when tossed into the air? A dime, mm. not a quarter. Dime was worth not like a nickel, a thousand dollars, silver back then. dollar, a dime. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. A, uh, it's not Billy Tess the Remington. I know a, that. Billy the Kid. <laughs> B, Annie Oakley. Are you just throwing some shade at Remington, like sh- out of, just for no reason? <laughs> No, I was saying Tess Remington is uh, is from the world of tumbleweed. She's I don't want to spoil anything. I know, no, you're just, no. but you're showing you just. Th- well, no, I guess it did sound like I was sort of throwing shade at her. I kind of was saying, well, she's not a you know a real person, so she. Can't oh, I it. see, but I see what no. you're saying. She was, she's, yeah, she's a great, yeah, she's a great sharpshooter. I apologize, Tess. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, like you know, getting on the bad side of a sharpshooter seems like a silly no, it's a bad idea. Yeah, so yeah. A, Billy the Kid, B, Annie Oakley, C, Wild Bill Hickok. Or D, mm. Bat Masterson. And be, while you're thinking, I just want to comment on the names of these characters That's that went. So good. So good. And s- like your names fit right in. I just want to say, and I, like, let it be a plug for the Glenn McCarty books, but he does these names that yeah. would just fit, fit right in with Annie Oakley, Wild Bill Hickok, and Bat Masterson. Yeah. Bat Masterson is a good one. Well, I feel like I want to say Annie Oakley, the, uh, the inspiration for Tess Remington. Um, so. Yeah. You did get on her bad side, so you might want to just make it up. By yeah, I think so. I do. I really do. Okay, so yep. B, Annie Oakley. Yeah. Oh, yep. That wasn't it. That wasn't it. No. It was Wild Bill Hickok. Wild Bill Hickok. You could also okay. shoot an apple from a tree with one shot and then hit the apple with another bullet before it hit the ground. Yeah, but but did did old Wild Bill write these press releases himself? <laughs> <laughs> Because we know Annie Oakley was a gray line between fiction and nonfiction. Like Buffalo Bill was like, like writing novels about Buffalo Bill. Like, yeah, yeah, right. Like you know, and while Bill, I mean, he's basically just she's just showing off, talking about all the money he can shoot, and not even care. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It sounds like you're just in the tumble. You're in the camp for Tumbleweed Thompson. So you know. (laughs) All right, next question. Glenn McCarty, what was the name of Buffalo Bill's gun? Speaking of Buffalo Bill. A, Old Tick Licker. B, Bushwhacker. (laughs) C, Lucretia Borgia. Or D, Ducephalus. Wow. Wow. One of those is actually the name. One of those, of, well, I was really well, hoping well, that when we get to the, got to the last one, that there would be one that really like stood Jim. out, but none of them stand out. David, did you look up hardest Western quizzes ever online? Because that's what I'm, I'm, I would get none of these right. Well, you're not an expert in the, in the, in the field. I'm not, mm. I'm not in the industry. Yeah. The industry of you're not a purveyor of Western lore. West. Uh, I guess I said, Glenn, is, Glenn is one of the chief purveyors of Western lore in America, right? Now. I just figured I knew something about the West. <laughs> Apparently not. I know it's West. Do you know yeah. what a horse is? Horse. Exactly. Yep. I couldn't draw you one, but I know what they are. <laughs> Glenn, what do you think? The name of Buffalo um, Bill's gun. I really just, I don't think that, I have no idea if this is right or not, but I really like, did you say Bucephalus? Yeah. That sounds awesome. Uh, you go with that one? That's a good name for a gun. Okay, here we go. Bucephalus is wrong. Wrong. But okay, oh. what's your next guess? What do you want to do next? Um, Old Tick Licker, Bushwhacker, or Lucretia Borgia? <laughs> Lucretia Borgia. Those are great. Um, I think I'm going to go with the first one. Uh, tick Licker. All it's right. Horrible. I can't believe I That's said. not it. So no. it is either, Glenn, Good. Bushwhacker or Lucretia Borgia. I think Bushwhacker. 
That would be my next guess. And Glenn, hopefully, you, it it is wrong. It is Lucretia oh Borgia. Oh my gosh! <laughs> what kind of a name for Buffalo Bill's gun is that? He, I don't she know. Named it after approve. the notorious Italian noblewoman, the subject of a popular contemporary Victor Hugo novel or opera of the era. Wow, Buffalo Bill. <laughs> he and a guy culture. named Bill Comstock competed in an eight-hour shooting match over the exclusive rights to use the name Buffalo Bill, which Cody won by killing 68 buffaloes to Comstock's 48. So, Yikes. What in the world? People in the 19th century, I tell you. Weird. That's just excessive. Okay. I, mean, I don't want to be judgy, but that's, <laughs> that's a bit much. Seems like a lot. Alright, well, thanks so much to Glenn McCarty for showing up and coming on by and talking about uh, Western stuff. Be sure to support his Kickstarter. Go to Kickstarter, search The Golden Road of Tumbleweed Thompson, or go to glennmccarty.com and click the link there or click on the link in his Instagram bio. He is such a good guy and the books are really cool and we really want to uh, make yeah. sure that this gets... Let's make this, this happen. Gets, I want happen. this book on my shelf. Exactly. And, I, and maybe if you can make it happen, he'll come on as a full segment on season five of, of Withy Windle. So I would love to. Yes, yes. Yeah. That'd be really cool. So go support that. Okay, Vesper Stamper. I, I thought she was really fun, Graham. She was great. So without further ado, here's our conversation with Vesper Stamper. Well, we are here with Vesper Stamper, and we are super excited to chat with you, Vesper. Thank you so much for coming on Withy Wendell. Thanks. Great to be here. We're going to start with a question that all the kids know is coming. We always say it's the most important question you're going to hear on this or any podcast. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for the hardest question? I don't know. I hope so. Cheetos, Vesper, or Doritos? Oh my gosh. See, told you. I uh, haven't had either in like a million years, probably since I was a kid. <laughs> but I think I would have to say Cheetos because I don't know, something about growing up in Staten Island, it's more mm. of a Cheetos place. <laughs> I did not know that about Staten Island. <laughs> <laughs> we had Doritos too, but I don't know, something about just, it. Just felt like a Cheetos. Cheetos vibe. Yeah. It just felt like it. I like that. It's like, I don't really store, think about, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right. So are you a snacker? You're an illustrator and a novelist, but are you a snacker when you're doing your work? Yeah, I am a snacker when I'm doing, I, I don't, I tend to eat more snacks than actual meals, unfortunately. <laughs> hey, same. <laughs> <laughs> what are you snacking on? Like what's your go-to snack when you're, when you're working on a novel or you're working on an illustration? Is this like true confessions or something? This is so like... <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I don't, I don't know. know. It depends on know where you're going to go. Uh, yeah. How dark? What, what is this? <laughs> you don't want to know what I, what stash I have over here. No, I mean, yeah. I always have to have some kind of chocolate for sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, you got you to gotta get those creative juices going and chocolate, you know, it's like the go-to yeah. for that. It's like a little, you know, it's caffeine. It's, it's a stimulant. Um, yeah. You know, I always have some kind of tea or coffee. Um, try to keep it toward almonds and the things that are not so bad for me or like, you know. The healthier yeah, yeah. snacks. Yeah. Well, who wants to do that though? I know. <laughs> I, I mean, look, would I rather just be eating like Kit Kat all day? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So but, are you, a, are you, do you prefer cookies or cake in general? Oh my gosh. This is so hard. Um, <laughs> I told you hardest question you're ever going to get on this or any podcast. <laughs> well, it depends on the cookie. Okay. And if it's a cake, it better have frosting because the cake is really just a vehicle for the frosting. Mm -hmm. Let's face it. But my grandfather taught me this. Yeah, wise man. Yeah. He's a wise. He's a wise man. He's yeah. a wise so, man. So you're not going in for the fruit cake or the bunt cake. Uh, gag me with a spoon. Um, <laughs> fruit cake. No. So okay. Well, what's your? You said depends on the the cookie. So what's your go to cookie? Like, are we talking chocolate chip cookies, oatmeal raisin? Uh, you know, like more in the chocolate chip range. I I like things like wafers. You oh, know, yeah. things with a lot of crunch to them. Yeah. yeah Shortbread. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That kind of thing. Is that also a Staten Island thing? Staten Island thing would be like the Anisette cookies, like the S cookies, okay. like Italian, Italian yeah, yeah. bakery, butter cookies. Mm. Yeah. That would be that kind of, actually, you know what? You just reminded me, my favorite cookie of all time is Florentines, like the lace cookies, Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, the kind of like toffee outside and then it has mm -hmm. the chocolate in the middle. I bet there's a bunch of kids uh, listening who have never had that. And there's going to be a probably. bunch of parents now going to the grocery store, having to find those cookies for the kid can have it for the first time. Yeah. They're, they're, awkwardly, yeah. Uh, awkwardly asking an 18 year old stock boy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Where the Florentines Where are. Where the Florentines I'm having no idea. Okay. Vesper, David has no idea. I'm going to do this. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. David's family is from Germany. Okay. Um, Vesper, you are from Germany. I was born there. I'm not born German. In Germany. I was born in an army base. Yeah. 
I see. What, do you have opinions on salted black licorice or Pfeffernusen? I, I have strong opinions on both. I hate okay. them both. <laughs> <laughs> I've never met anybody who liked one, but like didn't like the other. So my husband is of Swiss German heritage. Okay. Mm-hmm. And he loves them both, mm. adores them. Mm-hmm. Good man. Um, so if yeah. I'm ever in a place that has salted licorice, uh, y- you know, of, of a good kind, like right, either, right. Yeah. you know, a real candy store or, yeah. you know, then I will definitely pick him up a half pound of salt licorice and he'll keep that by his desk. Mm. And his family likes the pfefferness. Mm. I do not. I'm mm. sorry. If... You know, I got tricked into <laughs> eating pfefferness like a few times because I thought, okay, so growing up in Staten Island, right? There's not a lot of Germans in Staten Island. It's mostly like ah. Italian, especially Sicilian, you know, Polish, Greek. And so I grew up with these powdered sugar cookies that were like the, like rum balls or, or oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, you'd see the powdered sugar on the outside of this nice little round cookie. And then I, you know, come into his family and this, and I bite into it and it's like, and there they are. Yeah. And (laughs) no, it's just, no, give me the Greek half moons. Well, you know, know, the rum balls, my my grandmother. So she grew up in Germany. She grew up in Potsdam in Berlin. Like she lived there during the war and was the only Mm -hmm. one in her family to come over here and all that sort of stuff. And my uncles and my dad always say that German candy is like German people. You know, there's a little bit of a kick, a little bit of spice to them, you know, and, uh, you know, maybe an acquired taste at times. <laughs> Quoting my uncle about was, my grandmother. It's certainly true. It's certainly true. Yeah. yeah. Very, I would say very aggressive candies. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, do you think we could just talk to him, though? Like your husband, like, could he just come talk to us about German, about licorice? Like, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it, you don't need to talk to me. He's much okay. more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking of speaking of talking to you though, you've got a new book coming out mm-hmm. and you've done a bunch of illustrations. You've illustrated middle grade books and picture books, I believe, and then you've got your own novels, which are kind of like the YA older middle yes. grade. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Is that a kind of- They're not middle grade. I you know, we could get into YA. this, but they're true YA. I really um I have two teenagers myself, actually one's now an adult. <laughs> and hmm you know, trying to like, as a parent, trying to monitor the things that they were reading, it was impossible, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. trying to stay on top of everything that they were reading. And so I really, I write with parents in mind. I write with the whole family in mind, let's say, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I do write about very dark things. So I wouldn't say that my books, they don't have like suggestive content really, or like, mm-hmm. you know, but I, I, my first book was about the Holocaust. So yeah, there's yeah. some gruesome stuff in there. There's some yeah. really difficult stuff to to stomach that I think is really like, if I, if it was a perfect world and I had to, if all kids were my kids, I would say 15 and up, Okay. but I understand Mm -hmm. that every family has to make those decisions. And my publisher says 12 and up. Um, but you Mm -hmm. know, we could talk about that later if you want, but that's how (laughs) I feel about it. Yeah. Well, do you kind of want to give us a, like a quick overview of the, the themes that you, you know, that you like to write about and, you know, you, you're also an illustrator. So just right. some of the stuff that you've really enjoyed working on the most over the years. Yeah. I mean, I come from a childhood really steeped in fairy tales, like the, um, but not the Disney ones, the real mm. Grimm's Hans yeah, Christian yeah. Anderson, you know, and like different cultural myths and stuff. I had a reader when I was growing up that I don't know how it ended up, ended up in my house. It was like a school reader and it had all these different myths from different cultures around the world. And that was my go-to reading after school, you know? Mm. So um, those kinds of things are really, those stories were really important to me. So I'm coming out of that tradition. And also, you know, whether it's illustration or whether it's writing, I'm really coming from that tradition of story of storytelling. So my picture books are obviously much more younger kids, but I try to illustrate them in such a way that they're going to become the kind of book that a kid wants to take with them the rest of their life, Mm. you know, where there's just, it's, it's historically grounded. It's really timeless. It's Mm. um, there's a lot of different little things to look at. It's not dependent on like the quick turn of phrase or like the joke at the end or something. It's, you know, I want to create things that are perennial. Yeah. Yeah. And then in terms of my novels, um, you know, it's, it's for that really thoughtful reader, that really thoughtful teen who's really trying to understand 
the world around them and is emerging into realizing that there's a lot of messed up stuff that goes on in this world that you need a guide to kind of help you navigate through those dark woods, you know? Mm. So the novels that I write are really, they're really geared toward understanding how the main character navigates the the difficult historical times that they're that they're born into. Mm. So the first book is a Jewish teenager emerging from the concentration camps at the end of the Holocaust, having lost everything. And how what is she going to do now? You know, she's 16, mm. 17. She's not only survived this great trauma, but now she's becoming an adult. She's emerging into a really broken world, and but also realizing that she has agency and she can make her own choices now. Mm. Um, which is what every teen comes up against. Mm. And then, uh, you know, I write books about mass movements, about totalitarianism, you know, these kinds of things that are so big. And and when we read them in history books, they're so overwhelming, Mm. but we forget that it's everyday people that have to walk through those times and make their, their calculations. So I'm really interested in, you know, showing the consequences and showing outcomes and saying, okay, what kind of person do I, as the reader want to become, you know, uh, because we all, we know that as readers, we read ourselves onto every character, not just the protagonist, you know, we're wrestling with every secondary character and their choices and, and how these things intersect. So those are the kinds of things that I'm really hoping that readers will get out of my books. Hey, Graham, I think we, yeah. we had a question kind of related to some of the difficult things that come up in her books, right? Yeah, and this is a question from Jackson, and I think it's really insightful. Um, and it has to do with kind of your role um, in writing kind of some of these harder things. Um, so he says, uh, you write about some very heavy moments or historical events. Is it ever hard for you to cope with the weight of the task? And then he also asks, why Why do you choose this subject matter? Hmm. Jackson, that's a very compassionate question. I appreciate it. Um, The answer is yes, it's very difficult for me to dive into these things. The reason that I do it is because I think that that the alternative is to pretend that they don't exist. And I don't roll like that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'd much rather, um, I'm the kind of person who would much rather get into an argument if I feel like the outcome is going to be more peace. You know, I'm willing to go through the hard thing to emerge on the other side with a with a better understanding, you know, with better relationships, you know. So yeah, yeah. that's that's kind of how I roll. So, and I think because my the the front end of my life was very loaded with difficulty and trauma. And I I emerged from it, thank goodness, healthy on the other side. And so that's always been a question for me is how does that happen? You know, it's not just because I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps or gritted my teeth and bare, and bore it, but it, you know, I think there's some lessons to be learned through going through difficulty. Mm. So mm. as an author, I, I see my role as, you know, especially because I'm working for kids, it's like, okay, at this moment, I'm the grown up in the room. Mm. And as a parent, as a grown up, you know, you have to bear some things on your shoulders for the sake of the, of the kids. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I see my role as I'm able to take these things in and sort of churn them about and and metabolize them and be able to tell a story that's that's understandable for younger people. Mm. Do you we've got lots of questions from kids about like the books that you liked when you were a kid and so forth, but I want to have one I have one quick follow-up. When you're doing working in illustration and you're you're drawing something or sketching something and thinking about how this is going to end up turning out. Are you thinking about it in the same way? Like, cause sometimes you might be illustrating things that are difficult or, you know, different kind of, maybe they're not like, right. You're not writing about the, you're drawing a picture about the Holocaust, but do you ever, is it like a very different process for you when you're doing illustration versus when you're writing a novel in, in terms of how you're thinking about it? Yeah. It's so I like to say when I'm working on my novels, that some things are better painted with pictures and some things are better painted with words. Mm -hmm. So things like, I mean, we've all seen anybody who's studied the Holocaust, you know, you've seen the archival pictures and footage. It's horrifying. And it comes a certain point where you get saturated and you can no longer take it in. It's really difficult. I don't want to paint those pictures. Those images already exist. 
They're, mm-hmm. they're in the public record. Mm-hmm. What I'm more interested in is showing the inner life of the character on a poetic level so that you can come at the subject from the side door mm. and you're not, it's my work. I don't think is confrontational in that way. It's not visually confrontational. It's it more is drawing the reader and the, and the viewer in toward just a deeper level under the surface where, mm. where the emotions reside, where the, where the instinct resides, where the decision-making resides, all of those things. Mm. So that's what I'm trying to portray. So, you you mentioned that when you were younger, you went through some some difficult things, um, yeah. and but then came out. You said you feel like you came out on the other side of, you know, stronger and healthier and things like that. When you were a kid, were there were there any books that you loved that you turned to? Um, maybe when you were going through something difficult or that helped you, even if you didn't necessarily know that it was helping you. Mm-hmm. Like when you look back at your childhood. Do you look back at any titles or authors that were like, you're like, man, those people and those books really helped me? Oh, yeah. I still have them right right here on my bookshelf. <laughs> yeah. My my copies of, um, it was more illustrations for me. I, I was a very mm. early and advanced reader. I was reading by two and a half, something like that. Mm. Um, but I didn't enjoy reading as a kid. I really didn't enjoy reading until later high school. It just wasn't. It wasn't my thing. It was more about the pictures for me. Mm. And so I can't point to certain novels or anything like that until I was much older. But as a kid, it really was these fairy tales. In particular, uh, there was a, a copy of Cinderella that was illustrated by Hilary Knight. So Hilary Knight is more known as the author illustrator of Eloise. But his fairy tales and things like that were a completely different style. They weren't that kind of wacky, zany kind of style that Eloise is. It was just this very magical, elegant kind of way of visual storytelling. And I I would come home every day and copy the pictures from that book. And that's how stories got into me. Um, and But I, I say it a lot that books really were, books and my grandparents were what mm. got me through that childhood because mm. both of those, it was like an, there was an exit door at the end of, you know, through all the the tumult and the chaos, I could see that there was, there was a way out. And that's really what books did for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you, who would you point to as some of your like inspirational writers, like as a writer now, like the people that you kind of look at as your, you'd love to be them one day type of thing. Oh my goodness. It's funny. I was just making a a list of these today because I just opened up a bookshop um, affiliate store. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and I thought, yeah, I'll throw my you know different influences in there, and because there's certain books that I talk about all the time. So I have, uh, I'm, I don't read a ton of fiction. I'm that might be surprising, but mm. I'm, I'm really interested in ideas, and I take in the ideas and kind of like turn them about, and then those ideas kind of inform the stories that I tell. So there's a few books for me, a few writers like Chaim Potok is one of them Oh yeah, uh, who wrote The Chosen and My Name is Asher Lev. My Name is Asher Lev is really one of those top five for sure. Uh, I feel like he handles language and vocabulary the way that I aspire to and always feel like I'm falling short <laughs> with, you know, but he's just such a master linguist, but it's the language never gets in the way of the story. It just always aids the story. It's really amazing. Mm-hmm. And people like Anthony Doerr, um, obviously the Brontes, Jane Austen, people like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Graham, what should we ask next? We got we got these, quite a bunch of these questions from kids. You just pick one. Just pick one, not random. <laughs> just All spin right. around a point. Catherine wants to know, what do you find easier, illustrating or writing? And is there one you enjoy more? And which came first? <laughs> All three answers to that, those three questions are illustration. <laughs> it's easier. I enjoy it more. And what was the third one? Which came first? Uh, did it come oh, first? Oh, it came first. Yeah, for sure. So I only yeah, started you, really, you already answered that. Yeah. yeah. So I started writing. I, I always wrote, I always journaled and I always wrote poetry and songs. But I didn't start writing fiction until I was in my late 30s when I went to grad school. Around the time I went to grad school. Um and it really surprised me that I had a story to tell. Huh. And it was actually Daniel Nairi that read my fair, my very first fiction piece. 
and told me to keep going. So always credit him. Huh. Well, yeah. we, Daniel is like, he is, um, I feel like he's the, just a very generous person who's very like about encouraging people. So that makes a lot of sure. sense. Yeah. So you say you were, you started writing when you were in grad school. So mm-hmm. then when you were a kid, you weren't writing stories and th- doing that kind of thing at all? No, no. Every time I would get some sort of creative writing assignment, I would panic. Hmm. Because I felt like, well, that's for those other kids over there that are good at it. You know, let me, I'll just draw, you know, I'll just tell, I'll, I'll just draw a picture and then you'll get everything that I want to say, but trying to, Mm -hmm. I always felt like I would start writing something and then it, it didn't, I I didn't know how to end it or what, why I was writing, you know, I wasn't really taught anything like craft. So it was really very intimidating for me. So, so yeah. as as an illustrator, like you grew up drawing, you grew up illustrating things like that. You loved that that came yeah. first. Did that teach you things that you think helped you then when you became a writer as an adult? It really took a long time. It, you know, I have a degree in I have two degrees in illustration. So my undergrad and my grad are both in illustration. They're what I don't know, sixteen years apart, something like that. And it, I thought I knew what I was doing because I just wanted to paint pictures, but I didn't really understand how to use those illustrations to tell stories. That took a really long time to understand even what illustration was. And the fact that it's not just about making a nice picture for, to, to print on a tea towel or something, or make a greeting card. Like mm-hmm. that's a different, that's, that's more design. That's more, you know, surface design. It's a different discipline completely. And I like to do that kind of thing too, but it really wasn't until midway through my career that I realized, oh, the like illustration literally means to enhance a text with pictures. Mm. And it, it was in grad school that I, that I learned how to do that. Mm. Yeah. So June wants to know, keeping on your uh, theme of your illustration, she says, I love your style. What medium do you primarily use? Is it watercolor? And do you have a particular medium you suggest people start with? Oh, those are two very different things. <laughs> very, very different things. So I would say that I work mostly in water media. So that would include things like watercolor, gouache, and ink. Mm. But I treat them all the same. I handle them all in the, in a similar manner. It's just that each of those media have slightly different characteristics depending on the project that I'm doing. So something like watercolor gives a much softer kind of look. So if I'm looking for something much more calm, you know, I'll use watercolor. If I'm looking for brighter colors, it's a little bit harder to get that degree of vibrancy with watercolor. So I'll turn to gouache. But then a lot of times for my young adult novels, I like to work in ink but I'll paint with it like watercolor with a lot of water in it because it gives this really kind of archival, um, moody, atmospheric, black and white feeling that feels like it really lends itself to illustrating historical subjects. Hmm. So in all three of my novels, I've used the, this black ink and only in a cloud of outrageous blue, did I add any watercolor to that? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All the choices that you have to make. Uh, Yeah. And then as far as um, what I would suggest that kids start with, I would say not watercolor. It's a really difficult, you kind of have to get your legs under you before you start using media like that, because it's really like learning how to dance. And Mm. it's kind of the difference between, you know, taking a general movement class and then getting into like, the corps de ballet of, of like American <laughs> ballet theater or something. It's, you know, it, you, you just, you have to know some basics first. And so I would say for sure, pencil learning how to really shade things and, and draw what you see is especially important. Um, even things like markers where you're not so concerned, like you're, you're not going to be able to erase it. It's like, you have to put a mark down on the paper and, and just leave it there and you can't stress over it too much. You just, put it down and, you know, accept it. Mm -hmm. But I, I learned with, um, I learned with pencil. Mm. I did a lot of pencil drawings before I ever moved on to anything else. 
So uh, when you when you were revealing that you grew up on fairy tales, you love fairy tales. Yeah. Uh, this this is not a surprise by looking at your work. Uh, David and I both love fairy tales. Um, we have um, multitudes of collections. So I was, I was thinking of like Arthur Rackham a little oh, bit. Yeah. I like Kay Nielsen. I see some of this stuff. How would you describe your style? Do you do you have like a? It's definitely like your own style. Um, but do you have like a little a little way you like to describe it to people? That's a good question. I haven't had to describe it on those terms in a little while. But I good job identifying like two of my main influences. I mean, I think I'm. Done. <laughs> I think, um, and that's why I love Hillary Knight so much, because I think that he really is coming out of the golden age illustrators in that same way. So Lisbeth Zwerger is another one who I just mm -hmm. adore. And yeah, she's definitely coming out of the kind of Rackham, you know, those, those really moody atmospheric, uh, but also this elegant line and everything. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if I had to say something, I would say I'm, I'm probably in that school of the golden age, but I mean, I can't really, <laughs> that would be a big, that would be a big audacious claim to make. <laughs> I would say I'm a student of the golden age. Let's inspired say that. Inspired by them. Yeah. yeah. Inspired by the golden age, but there's other illustrators now that I really um, enjoy, like Isabel Arsenault, Felici de Sala, um, Carson Ellis, people like that who are, maybe a little bit more abstract, I would say, you know, or just kind of breaking things up a little bit, but still seem to be in that kind of magical world mm. where they're just letting the material, like there's a, there's a quote yeah. by this poet, Scott Cairns, that says the substantive oh, yeah. qualities of the medium must become adored. And I, I have it plastered on my studio wall. I, have my students memorize this quote. I, I teach at university. Uh -huh. They have to memorize this quote because the only thing that can keep you going as an illustrator, or any kind of artist really, is that you fall in love with your materials. Mm. Otherwise it just becomes drudgery and you're just moving things around on the paper, whether that's words or whether that's paint or whatever. You have to actually like, it has to become an extension of your body. It has to become like food or water you know, the way that paint moves on the, on the paper, things like that. You have to fall in love with that. And that, that's what I think in all of those illustrators, you feel that love. Hmm. Like okay. they can't live without it. You know, I have a question of how this relates to writing then. So when you're writing okay. a book, are you writing on a computer or do you like write with pencils and pens and on paper and like, cause it's, I find writing on a computer like faster, but I'm usually annoyed as opposed to falling in love with my keyboard. <laughs> so I'm curious how you write. Yeah, it's it's both. So when I'm under a deadline, I mean, sometimes I just don't have time to write on paper, but yeah. I really do prefer writing longhand because I think there's a just a closer connection physically. Mm -hmm. And you don't have this like the computer mm -hmm. can feel like such a presence. It can feel almost like a like an intruder. Mm -hmm. And sometimes like it this, is an intruder. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and it's it's way easier to get distracted when you're on a computer. Mm -hmm. um, so I prefer to at least start things longhand. Like I'll start a scene longhand. And for some reason, I'm able to access more of the poetic language that way. Mm -hmm. But then when I have to compile things, I mean, I yeah. use all sorts yeah, yeah. of tools on the computer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have a question here from Torin. And this is a question we've we've had a couple of different authors on this season who write historical fiction. So... We've asked this one a couple times now. If you could go back to any place in time, like any decade, which would you go back to? Oh, that's a that's definitely like be careful what you wish for. That's that's what all, <laughs> that's what everyone says as they're thinking about the answer. <laughs> because you're like, oh yeah, I would have loved to live in the Middle Ages. Oh wait, I probably you, would be dead not. before I was 25. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like dysentery or something like that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm really fascinated by medieval England. Mm -hmm. Definitely would have loved to, you know, let's say as a visitor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know? Um, well, so you get to go for even, two weeks. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Two weeks. And you have all the modern 
medical conveniences that you can take. Yeah. With you. yeah. You have a backpack that you can, you can take with stuff. You yeah, have, have that. some hands and hands sanitizer gel. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and chocolate. Um, I, yeah. And chocolate. Yes, for sure. Um, but I also, you know, I'd love to go back to uh, more prehistory or at least, play, you know, times I say places, it's the same thing. Um, mm-hmm. Times where we don't have as much of a written record. So like prehistoric or like pre-Roman mm. Britain, I'd really love to visit. There's a um, podcaster, Neil Oliver, a British archaeologist, and he has a great podcast that starts to touch on some of those things. And there's some writers who've you know been able to kind of unlock the code of what life would have been like that back then, but that would be cool. Um, and definitely, I mean, um, first century Judea. Yeah, for sure. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 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 This is, this is interesting because I think, I, I don't want to call them cowards exactly, but other people who have come on this podcast have basically <laughs> said like, Oh, I don't know the 1920s because it'd, it'd be like, it's like old, but also modern. I like yeah. that. You're just like, I'm going to set the ground rules for this hypothetical question. I get to go for a short amount of time and I'm going to go where I actually want to go, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I wonder, yeah, I think it has to do with the phrasing of the question because Torin says, what decade? Any place in time, but what decade? And decade makes you think of the last hundred years, probably. So I guess so. Yeah, yeah no, my mind yeah. did not go to any time in this last 150 <laughs> years. No way. No way. I don't know. Ni- 1996 was a good year for me. Mm-hmm. So you know, I'd go back there. That was a good time for me too. <laughs> I'm telling you, the, the 90s in New York were golden age. Yeah. <laughs> they really were. Do you have a favorite? Um, we get a lot of questions from kids like, do you have favorite characters? Do you have favorite things like that in your books? But what I would like to know is as somebody who started as an illustrator, do you have a favorite illustration that you've done that you're really oh. proud of? Um, it could be something that was like the first really good illustration that you did, an illustration that was super challenging, that you uh, you accomplished something that was difficult. There's one that comes to mind. So, I mean, I have a lot of really early illustrations that I did and I look back on them. I, you know, it, sometimes when you look back on your work, it's just cringe because, you know, you didn't have the skill or whatever. But like, I accept those things as existing in the time that I did them and with the skill level that I had at the time. So I have acceptance over that. Yeah. Um, but the image that came to mind when you asked that was pretty much the centerfold of what the knight sings. I think it's pretty right in the center. And it's the, this one of the protagonist Gerta, and she's under the roots of a tree. Mm. That was the first illustration, I think, that I felt what I got out on the page was what was really in my head and in my heart. More, more than in my head, it was really in my heart. And I still look back at that illustration and I think if all my illustrations could reach that level of connection, then that would I would be doing really, really well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they almost never land that way though. <laughs> As someone who is the only art form that I'm really any good at at all is writing, but who always wishes I could draw or play music, I always think that when I see an amazing illustration, that, that what comes out is like, the soul or the heart of the artist in a way that doesn't, I don't feel like I can ever get out as a writer. So that sounds very appealing to me, what you're describing there. (laughs) Yeah, it's a nice feeling. Okay, Graham, not to transition from that, you know, that description of that moment, but it's time for a quiz. It's like, the kids, is it quiz time? Quiz time. The kids have been waiting for quiz time. So Vesper, um, Graham has prepared what is inevitably going to be just the the worst 10 minutes of your life. Oh no. Uh, of, your, of your day, of your day. Um, Graham, are you, are you ready? We, we do say sometimes authors have to bear the slings and arrows of this podcast. And this is what we mean. Okay. Why? Oh, I, I don't like it where, where David sells it like this. This is going to be the best <laughs> 10 sorry, minutes sorry, probably sorry. of your year. Yeah. Of your 10 whole minutes. Year. Yeah. I mean, I can't remember the last time I took a 10 minute test. <laughs> you know, couldn't you send me some study questions? Ten minutes was, we'll ten minutes was a random number. It's probably like less than a little that. Quick notes. <laughs> yeah. All yeah. right. All right. Go for so, it. So, as David, um, well, maybe you didn't say. Maybe I'm saying it right now. Uh, these quizzes that we prepare for the authors, David doesn't know what uh, what I've True. come up with when he does a quiz. I don't know what he's come up with. They are related to you or your work in some way, often tangentially. <laughs> is a generous, I guess, way to put it. Okay. Um, so, uh, Vesper, you have a book called A Cloud of Outrageous Blue. Uh, and in this book, uh, one of the characters has synesthesia. She, she's like so yes. 
unsure of what's about to happen. I <laughs> so I I wanted to come up with a quiz about synesthesia, oh, but gosh. I'm not that I'm not that smart at all. Okay. So I have a quiz prepared for you called the Outrageously Blue Quiz, all about blue things. Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> Sounds I, way I easier. No guts, no glory. Let's do it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh yeah, fortune favors the bold. All right. Question number one. Considered by many to be the bluest animal on the planet. The blue poison dart frog has an incredible azure hue and can be found in the forests of Suriname and northern Brazil. And as we all know, bright colors in nature often serve as a warning to potential predators and threats who might want to bother said animal. Okay, so what warning is this frog broadcasting with its blue color? Okay, option A, watch yourself, I'm super smelly. Option B, come too close and I'll ask you to read my screenplay. Uh, Option C, (laughs) hey, I'm poison. Uh, Option D, stay back unless you want to enter my aura of sadness. All right, what do you think? Tangentially related. See, we'll see what we mean. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to choose the sadness. I know that's not right, but I, oh. it's, it's got a poetic but quality you, that I like. But you want it to be right. I want it I to feel be like, right. I feel like there is an illustration of a, of, of a poison dart frog with an aura of sadness coming in your future. It's okay, possible. so Vesper, Vesper, here's the thing. Um, <laughs> scientists <laughs> will say it's the poison one. But nobody's ever asked the frog. No, of course not. You might be, you might yeah. be right. Yeah. And if you if you Google this frog, you will see it, it looks kind of melancholy. Yeah. I think you got this answer. <laughs> I think we're good. Perfect. And for the record, we don't know for sure whether the poison dart frog writes screenplays or not. So That's true. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, question two. Do you know what the bluest town in the world is? Well, I'll <laughs> tell you. It's no, I don't. It's Shaft. That's it's not the question. Shaf- <laughs> it's Shaf Shawan, a city in the Rif Mountains of northwest Morocco. Oh. It's known for its striking mm. blue washed buildings of its old town. Oh, I feel like I've seen pictures of this. Yeah. Okay. It's gorgeous. Yeah. It's by it's been said by some to be the bluest town in the world. Ooh. It's pretty blue. Love it. Uh okay, here's your question. If you were to go to Shaf Shawan and could bring one of these blue traveling companions with you, who would you choose? All right, A, the blue genie from Aladdin. Uh, B, Bluey, the titular character from Bluey. Uh, C, you don't know Sonic Bluey? the Hedgehog. Oh, got to look you that up. How old, your kids aren't young, are they? You no, said that they're a little they are older. not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a little kid's show. And it's delightful, and you would like it even if you don't know watching it with kids. You should watch Bluey. You would like, yeah. All right, uh, or uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, or uh, D, Violet Beauregard. Ooh, it was, I was going with Sonic, you know, just cause I'm, you know, my, mm-hmm. my brother played Sonic the Hedgehog in the nineties. Um, gosh, would I want to bring Violet Beauregard with me? That's the question. Good. Like it would be interesting, Good question. but it could also be a really <laughs> unenjoyable trip unless I yeah. could show her who's boss. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think I'm going to go with Violet Beauregard. Okay. This this is a very good answer. I, I think this is a correct answer because it would also fill your anecdote bag for like years. Yes. You could be talking about, you know what Violet did in Shaf Shawan? Yeah, it would just be like, it would be insane. Now, the right, question so, is uh, that in Shaf Shawan, do they have blue Oompa Loompas? Ooh. Does I've never the blue been. man group go question. play there? Ah, Yes. <laughs> Also, what do you think the bluest city is in the world if you define blue as sad? Ooh. Oh. Right now, that oh. would be New York. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Sorry. It, it's, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, she can say that because she's from there. I can say that because I'm from it's there. true. <laughs> yes. All right, what's next, Graham? Question three. All right, you may or may not have heard of this, Vesper, but for years, <laughs> this is true, for years, Photographs have circulated on the internet purporting to show the rare and little known blue strawberry. Okay. The photo, everybody Google this, well, or have your parents do it. Uh, The photos are often accompanied by a sales pitch for blue strawberry seeds and a promise that those seeds will grow into that blue fruit. Um, 
Now, these photos do indeed look awesome. And I see the allure of the blue strawberry, but alas, it is, it was and is a hoax. Um, however, this got me thinking, if you could turn one fruit blue, which would you choose and why? A, apple, blue apple. Uh, B, strawberry, just go with the OG hoax. Uh, C, watermelon. Or D, pineapple. I think a blue watermelon would be really cool. Yeah. So is the inside blue? Like what's that's, normally red is blue or is that's green what I would outside think. part? That's yeah. my follow-up question, David. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The in the interior is blue, but the exterior looks like a regular watermelon. Yeah, yeah. Cause that's a nice mm. that green and blue thing would be a really nice color combination. Be a nice like um mm. party trick. Yeah, it would yeah. be really you could play play a game where there's one blue rod, blue watermelon out there, and who who gets the blue watermelon? It could be a prize, could be the opposite of a prize. And if you swallow the seeds, <laughs> you grow blue oh, yeah. watermelons in your yeah. stomach. I mean, that's yeah, right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Speaking I of think. hoaxes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question four: Blue holes. Blue holes are large marine caverns or sinkholes that exist all around the globe, but particularly in shallow carbonate platforms, such as the Bahamas. This sounds like the stuff uh, of my nightmares, by the way, so go ahead. I'm, <laughs> I'm already having a panic attack, but go ahead. <laughs> the name is pretty much a perfect description to what these are. Big holes filled with water. They are exceptionally deep and are often accompanied by some fantastic lore. Mm. Uh, and I've actually swam in one <laughs> once. It was awesome. I don't believe that. Um, I'm trembling. Uh, a particular, a particular <laughs> blue hole in the South China Sea is the Dragon Hole, which is over 1,000 feet deep. And according to legend, who found what in its depths? Okay, was it A, the Monkey King and his golden cudgel? This is a real question. Uh, B, Euclid <laughs> and his golden ratio? Uh, C, Aquaman and his golden trident, or D, Sean Connery and his golden accent. And I know it's not actually gold, it's just a metaphor. Did Euclid go to China? Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go you with said Euclid. it was a real oh. question. I'm going to go I with Euclid. Know. That sounds like just the kind of legend that would exist. I don't know. I'm going to go with Euclid. It's the Monkey King. The monkey King. <laughs> <laughs> but sure. once again... Okay. But once again, golden cudgel. What I've done, I've done barely any research on this. So <laughs> I don't know. Just the minimum amount to get the question. Yeah. No, that that yeah. kind of sounds like something I would have read in that mythological reader growing up. Oh going yeah. Going to the dragon. Yeah. Oh yeah, hole. Chinese Chinese fairy tales. The, yeah. The monkey yeah. king going to the dragon hole to get his golden cudgel. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. The uh, the last question. Uh, number five, uh, Elvis Presley. Okay, the uh, king of rock and roll. Yes, he made he wrote uh, many ubiquitous and chart topping songs during his reign in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, sometimes, though, in music as well as life, the songs just don't hit. Uh, one of the king's misfires was the quote. This is from a review: "Insipid ballad." Uh, <laughs> And that song's name is Indescribably Blue. Hmm. Question. If you and me and David were to start an Elvis cover band that only played the flops, <laughs> what should the name of the band be? And can you practice on Thursdays or Fridays better for you? <laughs> you? What you don't know about Graham is that he actually does a great Elvis impression, which he could do for you right now. <laughs> really? <laughs> Uh, I need to see um, him. <laughs> no, I just made that up on the spot. I can't even think of what he what he says. What's his catch line? Tagline. I don't know. Anyway, have a ta- I think you just have to sing with the weird, like shaky voice thing. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> I should know this. We're gonna start the cover band. Together. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Wait, do I get a multiple choice with this or I have to make up the name? Well, we you might have, but I think I fell asleep before I wrote down the multiple choices. So it's just <laughs> open ended at this point. Well, I mean, titles are the worst part of any project. Very hard. They really are hard. That's why people go untitled. Yeah. That's why you should uh defer or pass the buck to David okay. to answer this question. I'm passing the conch. 
<laughs> so so the question is, what's the name of the the Elvis the cover Elvis band? Elvis cover band. It's all flops. Um, yeah. Um. What's the opposite of a king? A poppers? Flop, the poppers? Pres, the flop. Presleys. Oh. You just got to combine flop and Presley somehow. Elvis um, flop, please. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> This is she's you. You're the one that said the titles are the worst. Uh, this might be one we need to crowdsource with the kids who know nothing about Elvis at all. This was this was parents. a mistake. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would like to know actually how many kids who are listening have ever heard an Elvis song. I'd be very fascinated to know that. Should is we that, uh, should we shelve this question and I just go and I do my bonus question? Oh my gosh! Yeah, I think the crowdsourcing is a really good idea. Actually, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll keep the bonus question in the pocket then. Yeah, it's probably for the best. All right, how does she do on this on, the, on your ridiculous quiz, Graham? I, I'd say four out of five is passing with flying colors, especially yeah. in the blue hue. Um, but we yeah. do have to send it off for review. It takes like six yeah. to eight weeks to get oh, confirmation. Processing. So, yeah, yeah it's we'll gotta, send you. It's, a, it's like it's like a um, Scantron situation here. Scantron. We'll send you something. Good old Scantron. Yeah. Yeah. Every, as you've been giving the answers, I've been penciling them in on the sheet here. And so if I, if I got the even put the right one down, I don't know what A, B, and C. I was just guessing. Yeah. So we're going to I thought it you were we'll writing you like my resignation letter yeah. for me. <laughs> for, for this podcast? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or my pink slip. Going to need a new co host here soon. I All think right. that quiz was great. And, uh, and, <laughs> and was best for you, it was it awesome. fascinating. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, fasc- fascinating is definitely the most complimentary thing I can think of for that quiz. I, I learned a <laughs> okay. lot, I have to say. I learned yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's enough nice things about the quiz. It's time for our <laughs> word of the week, uh, which means that we've got to uh, we've got to hear from the bookstore troll. And so, I, Graham, I have this week's um, telegram to share with you. Are you ready to, to hear? No, you you got the telegram. I've got the telegram. It came. Okay. Okay. Came, Wait, yeah. is it a postcard or a telegram? No, it's a telegram. He's oh. really leaning into the telegram. Okay. Actor here. Okay. Uh, dear doofuses, stop. <laughs> this is the, he's not a very nice bookstore troll. Ever. Trolls usually this, aren't. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's, nice. it's a thing. Yeah. This is the best part of my trip yet. Stop. Finally, a cave worth stopping for. Stop. Oh. Lots of darkness. Lots of rocks. Stop. I hope never to see your dumb faces again. Stop. Oh. Here's your here's your word. Okay. So then what we do is we have to pull off the, the sticker here. And there's not really a word of the a bookstore troll Vesper. It's just... Yeah, there's don't not? be scared. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here is our word of the week. Vesper, are you ready to write this down? Okay. Do you have, a, uh, do you have something uh, to write this down? I'm going to write and implement. With? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. All right. Okay. Control. It is... It is... Ulo... Trike... Ulo Tricuous. U L O T R I C H O U S. Ulo Tricuous or Trick Tricus or Looks like Ulo Tricuous. No. Something like that. Yeah. Ulo Trick. No, you're so, right. Oh. Hmm. Uh, I, I, probably not. Okay, let's let's take a second. We're gonna come up with what we think this word means, and when we come back, we will reveal our choices. Okay, we are back. It is our custom for Graham to go first and then I'll go and then we'll let our special guest uh, go third. So Graham, what do you think this word means? I think it me- I think we're pronounced we're supposed to pronounce it eulotricus. And if we're not, that's what we're going with. All right, eulotricus or eulotricus. Well, everybody knows <laughs> that uh, this is a a condition uh, similar to lockjaw but very specific. It's when somebody comes at you with a particular particularly salty uh, licorice and your mouth just clamps shut and mm. like even if they move away with the licorice it can last hours mm. so Vesper's experienced this many times it sounds like mm-hmm. yes yeah every time I try to eat salt licorice yeah <laughs> or it comes near you right it's yeah just in the room you, you <laughs> all of a sudden are suffering from eulotricus eulotricus yeah, it comes from the Latin <laughs> mm-hmm. So what I think, I, mean, I think that's a good guess, but I think that, I think it actually is that, so you know that feeling when you've been wearing uh, a hat, particularly like a, like a three cornered, you know, like, uh, like uh, colonial style hat. As one is want to do. Yeah. Right. As one like like want a to pirate? Do. No, like, you know, more like you're going into the, like uh, the congressional, the first congressional Congress. I'm thinking more like civilized three cornered hat, Graham. Oh, so you've been case. wearing that hat for a long time. 
And then when you take it off, you still have the feeling like there's something on your head. That's what I think Eulotricus is. Mm. Mm. It's that feeling. Yeah. And it's that's, only like that hat? Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. That's why we have so many words because you have to have a word for every different kind of hat that you yeah. have that experience. That'd um, be different if you were wearing a bowler hat. That's a completely different condition. It, it would be a completely different word. That's Bolo- you, what do you Bolo- think Bolo- that Bolo- word? Bolo- yeah. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, Baltricus. <laughs> <laughs> Vesper, what do you think this weird word means? Well, I happen to know the the actual definition of this, and it's Ooh. it's of or pertaining to the shrill sounds made by nasty bookstore trolls when they realize the cozy cave they've chosen has a crack, letting in a shaft of sunlight, making them run back in repentance to their nice bookstore haven. You know, mm. yeah, and I have a feeling that we are going to be experiencing, yeah, the. Uh, the after effects of that 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 definition of Ulotricus mm-hmm. here soon. I haven't I haven't wished Ulotricus on many trolls, but I do miss <laughs> our bookstore troll. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I you do know, hope he, a he sliver says of light mean things to him. us. He says mean things to us all the time. He steals our dictionaries, but you know, then when he's gone, you feel like there's an absence. Yeah. There's just an absence in the basement. Yeah. Every bookstore needs a troll, that's for sure. Yeah. So okay, so the actual Meaning of Ulotricus is having woolly or crisp hair. Like, so uh, related to curly hair? My son has this kind of hair. Hmm. Ulotricus, okay. It comes from the Latin ulotrici, which is a division, a division of humankind having crisp or woolly hair. Uh, so, yeah, it's like comes, it's this, it has to do with rolling. So like when you put curlies on your hair, for example, I suppose you would be, uh, I was going to say suffering from Ulotricus, but I think okay. in that case, you're just doing it on purpose. Or it so. doesn't sound like suffering. It just sounds like what just your like, hair is like. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah. I understand the adjective woolly. All right. The second one, I'm, tr- I'm trying to figure it out. Crisp hair? Woolly or crisp? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's crisp. a great thing is if your hair is curly, let's say, didn't crisp imply like, it's kind of like sharp and pointy and like I'm telling you, my son has this kind of hair. So nice. I'm gonna actually be able to use this word in real life today. Nice. Yes. Nice. Yes. nice. So Excellent. Your hair is David and very I... Ulotricus today, dear. <laughs> <laughs> David and I are from the great white north, um, originally. And so whenever I think of crisp hair, I think of getting like going outside in the snow yes. in the cold weather while you've just taken a shower. Yeah, that's very um, cool. <laughs> yeah. Wait, where exactly. are you guys from? Uh, I'm from Western Canada and David was born near Toronto. Oh, yeah. Canadians, eh? And but now we're, yeah, yeah, but now we're in the South. And yeah, we, both lived that, in, eh? we both lived in the Midwest for a while too. Very cold there too. Um, yeah, we lived in Iowa. I lived in Wisconsin for a while and um, didn't live in New York though, but that's cold oh. too. Yeah, you're. It's depending on the on the year. You can get the crisp mm-hmm. hair. It happens. The crisp yeah, hair. The, yeah. the Elotricus experience, especially the crisp nose hair. That's another experience. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that also is known to happen when you um, get too much very strong licorice in the room. Yes, this is true. <laughs> so, all right. Well, Vesper, we need to let you go. Before we do that, though, can you give us? Mm. Can you answer one more question for us? Do you have sure. time for one more question? Absolutely. Okay. What advice do you have for the kids who are listening of all ages who want to be authors or illustrators themselves? Mm. So I would say to ignore anybody who tells the, tells you that you're not good at it, first of all. If it's something that you enjoy, you should just do it. And it's always the people who do it that become better, not the people who are sort of naturally gifted and don't do it. Those people eventually stall out and fade away and they don't love it. You know, um, if you love to do something, you should just do it no matter what anybody says either way. But the other thing, especially for writing, um, I would say, keep a journal that journaling is probably the most important thing that you can do as a writer, because it's how you observe the world around you and how, and you know, there's nothing new in the world. There's no new stories really. But the only thing that's new is how you are experiencing the world as an individual. Mm-hmm. So journaling for sure is the thing. And if it's if drawing is your thing too, I would say just keep a sketchbook and draw every day, especially just drawing things around you that are interesting to you or people. Mm-hmm. 
you know, just learning to connect your eye and your hand together. It doesn't all, all have to come from your imagination all the time. Your imagination is fed by the things that you actually see and do and touch. Mm. So yeah, it's really, it's a, it's a practice makes perfect thing. And I'm still practicing and I've been doing this a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's both like challenging that you have to keep working on it. And then also a little bit encouraging that not everything has to come out of your, like the blue in your imagination. Oh, no, 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 it's no. a little bit encouraging too. And you never, ever arrive. It's, you you know, if you're an artist or anything worth doing, you'll never arrive at, at having perfected it. It's really about the journey. Well, Vesper, you have come to the end of this particular journey. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the podcast really and hanging fun. out with us. Yeah, and, thank you. And uh, congratulations on the book and good luck with everything. Thank you so much. Well, thanks so much to Vesper Stamper for coming on the show. We had a great time chatting with her and hope mm -hmm. you had a great time listening. You can check out her book, Berliners. Wherever fine books are sold, Graham. And, mm -hmm. uh, and parents do remember um, just to be aware of the, to some of the content that might not be appropriate for younger kids, but, uh, but you can also check out her amazing illustrations as well. Graham, that brings us to riddle time. Riddle time. Riddle time. Well, it's, uh, it's time for another riddle. But first, we got to share the answer to last week's riddle. Did the kids get it right, Graham? Oh, yes. There yes, was a jewelry yes. heist and a policeman named Clark Kermit Dodge Bucket and uh, <laughs> yeah. some convolution. Yeah, and we got to share a little bit about our uh, experience in Police Academy. That that's was right. kind of a nice trip down memory lane. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So for the, the answer, one day that we were, the, the in Clark there. Clark Kermit Dodge Bucket needed to know needed to figure out who the third suspect was, and he and forgot his notebook. That's he right. Forgot his notebook. So yeah. so who was the third suspect? Oh, Graham? that third suspect the, uh, was named Tom, mm. and you said that like right away at the beginning of that riddle, and then threw in a bunch of details, convoluted everything, and hoped we wouldn't remember that you said it initially. That's, is that correct? That's exactly what happened. Okay. It's Tom. Congratulations to everyone who got it. If you got a correct answer, you'll be entered into a bucket. <laughs> Clark Kermit Dodge buckets. Not his bucket. Of, our bucket. Uh, of correct answers at the end of the season. We will draw one of your names to be the lucky winner of a book bundle. Well, David, I know you have a, a riddle lined up here, but did you know I have a riddle for you? Uh, I did All not. Right, David, what do you get when you cross a wet gym... Uh, with a crispy Philip, no, a crispy Kenneth. <laughs> what? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to find out though. That's the riddle. You don't oh, know. Oh, you don't, oh, yeah. oh, it's not a joke. It's a riddle. Yeah, no, it's yeah. a riddle. Well, so. a wet gym. You would need a towel because somebody's sweating all over the gym equipment. That's Is it, what you would need. A wet yeah, gym. I was gonna say. A, what, can you spell gym for me? Gym. <laughs> gym. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, this week's uh, riddle also involves characters. <laughs> Is it a pirate? Uh, cowboy pirate? Nope. Okay. Well, no. Does it involve scenes? It involves trains. Mm. Okay. Mm. So he, he, hear me out for a second, okay? I'm going to paint a picture for you. I'm not going anywhere. All right. Mitch and Carrie are visiting England. And they decide they're going to go up to York, to the north country of England. Uh, they want to take a day they trip. They want peppermint patties. To see, yeah, sure. They eat peppermint. The peppermint York patty peppermint. facility in uh, York. Uh, right. Okay. Yes. Yes. They want peppermint patties and also they want to see an old castle. Oh, so, okay. Where they make um, the peppermint patty. Because it was the, yes, yeah, that castle. And also the castle that is the site of uh, a great battle between the, uh, where the Vikings attacked. Okay. Okay. Uh, near like Lindisfarne or something. So they want to go up that way. Uh, centuries ago, they fought a great battle there. But after a day of sightseeing, they have to rush back to Oxford because they want to visit C.S. Lewis's house. There's lots of things to see in England, right? Oh, man. This sounds like a good trip. So so what they do is they jump on a southbound electric train that is traveling at 50 miles per hour. And they think, okay, that's going to get them there. Okay. Um, From York. It's a little windy, some of it. So it can't go as, you can't go like 80 miles an hour. It's going 50 miles an mm. hour, southbound electric train. Okay. Uh, the wind is blowing at north at 45 miles per hour, so there's a little resistance, right? Oh, so, dear. But, but they're confident they can make it. Everyone tells them they can make it. The, the arrival time is, is in time for them to catch C.S. Lewis's house before it closes, right? Before it runs away. Before, before it runs away. Yeah. They're going to get there before it okay, closes. Okay, got it. Okay. Now, along this, the way of this vacation, Mitch has been keeping a journal. Oh. With notes from the trip. And, nice. you know, he likes to keep very um, specific details of what he sees. Hey, he really wants to remember it, Maybe right? little sketches of peppermint patties. Sketches and... of peppermint patties. He, he took a lot of notes on how they make peppermint patties, things like that. <laughs> he just described all... exactly what it's like to dip peppermint patties in hot milk. It's all just those all peppermint details. Right, exactly. I mean, it's really why they went to England. So he wants to get the picture as vivid as possible so he'll remember. Okay. So he's describing the train. He's describing 
the trip back. Okay. And he wants to describe the smoke on this train. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to figure out in his mind for his sketch in his in his sketchbook in his journal which way the smoke is blowing. But he can't figure it out. And the train is going fifty miles it's going an hour. Fifty miles an hour southbound with the wind blowing south northbound. So they were north northbound and, wind. But they were miles. north. And now they're going south. And the wind is blowing north. And yep. the smoke is... Uh, which way the smoke would be going? Yeah, and, is, and so they're okay. so they're on board the southbound electric train that is traveling at 50 miles per hour. The wind is going 45 miles per hour. Well, I think I know it, but I don't know. So, it seems obvious to me that... Which way that's... I don't, okay. So so he's having some trouble figuring it out, but he really wants this picture to be perfect. as, yeah, as perfect yeah, as yeah. possible. So he needs your help. So we need to solve this problem for Mitch and his, uh, and his journal. So... We need to know which way the smoke of the train was blowing. Cool. That's this week's riddle. I like this one a lot. Yeah. And it was like, that's a nice scenic riddle. Yeah. 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 Nobody's in peril. Nobody, no, uh, no kids are getting kidnapped in this one. There's it's no, very hard to find riddles some, where nobody's getting kidnapped. These, uh, <laughs> that's true. Um, and then there's no, you know, they've got respectable names. Mitch and Carrie. Mitch and Carrie. It's no bucket. Well, I forgot to tell you Kermits. that. I forgot to tell you that it was Mitch... <laughs> S Spickle Moss and Ooh, Carrie Spickle Moss. Spickle Moss the third. Oh, okay. They brother sister. Yes, What's happening? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mitch Spickle Moss and Carrie Spickle Moss the third. Yeah, I forgot to mention that part. Sorry. Okay. Well, if you think you know the answer to this week's riddle, Graham, where should the people, should the kids, send their answers? They will write us in at podcasts at goldberrybooks.com. Or you can always send a pigeon. You could send the pigeon. Yeah. We, we're still waiting for... We've got a couple pigeons. I'll yeah. say that. But not, not as but many as we would have they're usually a year late with yeah. the riddle answer. Yeah. So email's probably the best. It's probably the best. Yeah. That's true. It's true. Mm -hmm. Graham, yeah. that brings us to the end of this episode. The uh, 4th.6th. The 4th... The 46th. The 4th... <laughs> <laughs> the sixth episode of the fourth season of Withingwindle. It's got to be actually getting close to 46, right? Or no. Wait. Well, yeah, maybe. No. I got, we got to go back and count because we didn't have exact numbers. It, I don't know. The numbers are the same in all the seasons. So some kid will tell I us. I think it's been illustrated throughout all of these episodes that maths <laughs> is not the strong suit <laughs> for one of like, us. <laughs> <laughs> Half of the riddles are figuring out math. Uh, all right, Graham. This yeah. has been really fun. Thanks so much to Vesper Stamper. Thanks to Glenn McCarty for making an appearance. And of course, go support his uh, his book on Kickstarter. And thanks to S.D. Smith. If you want to learn more about Jack Zulu and the Waylanders Key, you can head to jackzulu.com. That book is coming out on November 15th, but you can pre-order it right this very second. Graham, do you have anything mm -hmm. else you'd like to say to the children? Yep. Just don't forget about the Space Boys' famous catchphrase. You remember what it is, David? I do not. <laughs> 